Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight... We're not out looking for trouble. Sending federal law enforcement agents into U.S. cities. Is it legal or constitutional? The only question is, what is the full amount uh, that they ripped off the ratepayers? Could ComEd customers get reimbursed for too high electric rates? Now it's crunch time. We're trying to figure out, does it actually work? Large-scale coronavirus vaccine trials are now underway. Hear from Chicago leaders on local vaccine efforts. Meet the Secret Service agent who took a bullet for President Ronald Reagan and who's currently Orland Park's police chief. How should the Chicago Tribune and the larger media industry differentiate between news and opinion? What's behind the national coin shortage? Details on how to help money go around the country. When I do public art, I always try to have it be positive. Hound Evanston artist is transforming her neighborhood in her latest public art series. And historic scenes next to playful paintings in a massive private art collection. But first, a loss tonight for the Chicago Police Department. Paris has more on that and other top stories from today. Paris. Yeah, that is right, Brandis. The Chicago Police Department is mourning the death of one of its own in an apparent suicide. Dion Boyd, who was CPD Deputy Chief of Criminal Networks, was found dead at the department's Holman Square facility seen here in North Lawndale. Boyd is a 29-year veteran of the police department and was recently promoted to the deputy chief position. Police Superintendent David Brown says that Boyd will be greatly missed and asked the public to keep his family and their thoughts in their thoughts and prayers. And Superintendent Brown will be joining us tomorrow evening to talk about the difficulties officers face and other issues confronting the department. Add three more states to the quarantine list for Chicago travelers. Anyone traveling from Missouri, North Dakota, or Nebraska will be asked to self-quarantine for 14 days due to rising COVID numbers in those states. They join Wisconsin, which was added to the list yesterday, and 18 total other states on that list. At the same time, Illinois has been added to New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey's travel quarantine list, so that means any residents of those states that have traveled here will be asked to quarantine when they return to those states because of Illinois' rising COVID-19 numbers. Speaking of, the Illinois Department of Public Health announced 1,076 new COVID-19 cases today for a total of more than 173,000. The state also recorded 30 additional deaths, putting the total death toll at 7,000, 446. The seven day testing positivity rate is sitting at 3.8%. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. The Trump administration is deploying more law enforcement agents to Portland as protests are ongoing. Mayors across the country have pushed back against the federal government sending those types of agents to cities, including Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who threatened to sue if those paramilitary agents are sent to Chicago. Meanwhile, Portland protesters and the Wall of Moms have sued over the use of tear gas and rubber bullets that agents have used against them. And today, Attorney General William Barr testified on Capitol Hill. Here's some of what he had to say. Since when is it okay to try to burn down a federal court? If someone went down the street to the Prettyman Court here, that beautiful courthouse we have right at the bottom of the hill, and started breaking windows and firing industrial-grade fireworks in to start a fire, throw kerosene balloons in and, and start fires in the court, is that okay? Is that okay now? No, the U.S. Marshals have a duty to stop that and defend the courthouse, and that's what we are doing in Portland. We are at the courthouse defending the courthouse. We're not out looking for trouble. Joining us to talk about the legal and constitutional authority the president has to send federal agents into cities are Harold Krentz, a former prosecutor and professor at Chicago Kent College of Law. His book, Presidential Powers, is a comprehensive examination of the president's role as defined by the U.S. Constitution and judicial and historical precedents. And Joe Morris, a former assistant attorney general under President Ronald Reagan, who oversaw managing cooperation among federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Gentlemen, welcome to Chicago Tonight. Welcome back. So Thank you. we've Thank seen you. the video. We've seen the video of people being rounded up off the street. Uh, the mayor of Portland, uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler, said, quote, people are being denied probable cause and due process. The people aren't identifying themselves, and as far as I can see, this is completely unconstitutional. Harold Krent, are the tactic tactics that we're seeing in Portland unconstitutional? Some yes and some no. Clearly, the president has the right to 
defend federal inst instrumentalities, federal institutions like the courthouse. Um, but the federal officials, federal law enforcement officials who go there cannot stray away and just engage in ordinary law enforcement and certainly can't break up protesters who are protesting about George Floyd or other kinds of issues. So what we've seen on TV so far, some justified, some not. Joe Morris, what's your take? Are the agents depriving people of their First Amendment rights? Well, I've seen no evidence to that. I certainly I agree with Harold Cran on both propositions. That is that the federal government has an absolute right to defend federal property. Here in Chicago, that means the courthouses, that means the post offices, the docks, the, the locks, the dams, uh, the EPA building, the VA hospitals, and so forth. Those are federal installations, and federal law enforcement officers have a duty to defend them against destruction. Uh, and violence to the people in, inside them. On the question of whether or not federal law enforcement agencies should supplement local and state police authorities in enforcing what are primarily state laws uh, against ordinary street crime, that's a different question. Now, in most cities across the country, there are already pre-existing relationships between federal agencies and local police to do exactly that. We have a exactly such a system in Chicago. The question is, should that be uh, should that be expanded? And that's a question that ought to have polite, robust, intelligent conversation between the leaders of the federal executive branch and local mayors and other law enforcement leaders. And Harold Crant, can Mayor Lightfoot stop such, you know, a federal paramilitary force? Well, my understanding is that she has come to at least a tentative agreement where that any federal troops would use as a tactical basis to try to help her in terms of the fight against gangs and against violence on Chicago streets, not deployed against protesters. But just to add, if you're a federal officer, you still have to comply with all the dictates of the Constitution and make sure that you apprise people of their rights, um, ensure they can have access to an attorney, um, identify you as a federal police officer. And again, there's clearly been some instances of violations of this in Portland, and we hope they're not ongoing, but we have a right to be fearful that they might be. Joe Moore, so after President Trump said that he would send agents to more cities, Philadelphia's district attorney uh, laid out how he might arrest and criminally charge those federal officers. Can he do that? Well, it's theoretically possible if they, if they violate state laws, but if, they, if, if what they're doing is enforcing federal laws in the process, it doesn't have much of a chance. Here in Chicago, we had a beefing up, uh, an enhancement of federal law enforcement just over this past weekend. It was, it was a, a pre-existing kind of enforcement, FBI, DEA, and ATF agents who've already been working with the Cook County Sheriff and the, and the Illinois State Police and the Chicago Police Department in a metropolitan-wide program of, of fighting back drug, uh, sorry, gun gangs and trying to enforce existing gun control laws. And it worked. Uh, we, we had several successful arrests uh, this weekend, Operation Legend, it's called. And as I understand it, nobody's constitutional rights were violated. Everybody was read the Miranda rights and the ordinary proprieties were observed. Harold Krent, President Trump, you know, as we've been discussing, uh, says that, you know, these agents are defending federal property, federal laws. Is his authority limited or unlimited in this? Well, it's clearly limited. I mean, the Congress has given him the power to defend instrumentalities. It came with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002. Um, but again, federal government cannot engage in ordinary law enforcement. They can't engage in just trying to quell political protests. And clearly we've seen some evidence of that in Portland where the federal law enforcement authorities have gone astray. There have been four or five lawsuits that have already been filed. And in one case, there's been a temporary restraining order that's been ordered, filed, well, granted against the federal law enforcement authorities for picking out journalists and trying to muzzle journalists who are trying to capture the confrontation between individuals in Portland and law enforcement. So some, obviously some elements of the federal law enforcement authorities have gone way too far, and that's what is frightening about this escapade. Uh, Harold Krent, the Trump administration is sending more troops. Portland protesters, including the Wall of Moms, uh, are suing the Trump administration over the use of rubber bullets and tear gas. What's the legal justification for uh, keeping or stopping the use of those tactics? I think that's gonna be a tough uh, lawsuit for the, for the plaintiffs to, to win on. I mean, it's a judgment call. When do you need to have such kind of force? And if actually there are walls being scaled or windows being broken, people are forcing themselves to entry into federal buildings, it might be that rubber bullets might be appropriate. Hard to second guess that as a judge. If the federal authorities on the other hand are using such tactics, 
outside the perimeter of the federal instrumentalities, then I think they may be susceptible to defeat in the, in the litigation. Joe Morris, we've got about 20 seconds left, but the mayor of Portland is asking for a ceasefire meeting with the acting director of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but a leaked email to CNN shows that uh, those forces Stop. are expected to be in Portland through mid-October. Briefly, how can an agreement be brokered here? Well, that's a political question for the mayor of Portland, who seems to be really falling down on the job. Uh, there's no question about the authority of the federal agencies to protect federal properties. They have to do it, and they should be encouraged to use non-lethal force, such as tear gas and rubber bullets, when they do that job. On the question of uh, assisting the, the mayor and the local police in doing their jobs, that's another question. And if I were advising President Trump, I would say, be leery. Don't make their problems yours. If they can't control their city, don't uh, make their inability to control their city your problem. Okay, Harold Krent and Joe Morris, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Commonwealth Edison attorneys briefly went before a judge, a judge today, a formality related to its recent deferred prosecution agreement with the U.S. Attorney's Office. It is expected that hearings directly related to the company's recent admission of bribery will be rare. But now the company's still looking at more time in court facing class action lawsuits from consumers. Amanda Venicky joins us now with details. Amanda. Yeah, so Brandis, ComEd is facing financial repercussions in light of the shocking admission that some of its top executives actively engaged in bribery in order to get favorable legislation passed in Springfield. ComEd has to pay a $200 million fine. I think it's important to keep in mind that not a penny of that it, is going to the ComEd ratepayers. That money is simply a fine that's being, that will ultimately be remitted to the U.S. government. So just so we're clear, that fine is going to go to federal coffers. It's not going to be dispersed to ComEd customers like you, me, pretty much everybody in Northern Illinois. Attorney Adam Levitt is one of the lawyers who's filed a class action lawsuit seeking to get customers essentially a refund for what they say is nearly a decade of overpaying on electric bills. According to the complaint filed in Chicago Circuit Court, from 2011 through the present day, millions of individuals and businesses owning or leasing property and operating businesses in the state of Illinois were unknowing victims of a vast and corrupt criminal scheme perpetuated by the state's largest utility company. So the purpose of our lawsuit uh, is, to, is to work toward seeking full and complete justice for ComEd ratepayers to be made whole for what we believe will, will be shown as improper inflation of rates. Right now, there are six plaintiffs, all ComEd customers, some individuals, some businesses. But the goal is to achieve class action status on behalf of ComEd's roughly 4 million customers in the area. Attorney Stephen Blendon says they've got a good case, likely made easier because as part of the deal ComEd made with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the utility agreed that it will neither contest the admissibility or contradict the statement of facts in any such proceeding, including any trial, guilty plea, or sentencing proceeding. In the deferred plea agreement, we see that Commonwealth Edison has acknowledged that they have received over $150 million in benefit as a result of this bribery scheme. This lawsuit is to determine the full extent, because we all know that Commonwealth Edison did not admit to $150 million, uh, that this goes much deeper than that. How much deeper, he says, is what they plan to find out as the case proceeds, which means they've got no answers to the money question, which is, should the class action succeed? How much money could ratepayers be looking to get? Well, the other money question, what could this lawsuit mean for Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan? He's public official A in the Fed's court filings in the payoffs circled around him. Madigan has denied any part in the scheme and says subpoenaed documents will prove that. He also has not been charged. ComEd's deal with the Feds, in which it is agreed to cooperate with prosecutors, change its lobbying practices, and to pay that $200 million fine, means 
that the utility will get to avoid really airing its dirty laundry in court in regards to the bribery case. Attorneys in the class action case say they're focused on rate payers and not on Speaker Madigan. So don't expect him to be deposed. But combat executives looking to stay out of the limelight won't likely be able to avoid it. I suspect that we will be deposing um, all of the Commonwealth Edison and Exelon decision makers all the way up to the top. If he gets the chance to depose them, that is, ComEd is pushing back against the narrative that the two laws at the heart of the court action were wrong and that customers were overcharged because of them. In a statement, spokesman Paul Ellsberg says ComEd apologizes for its past conduct. The improper conduct described in the deferred prosecution agreement, however, does not mean that consumers were harmed by the legislation that was passed in Illinois. The deferred plea agreement makes no such allegations. And in fact, the bipartisan legislation resulted in substantial benefits for ComEd's customers, he says, including 70% improved reliability since 2012 and billions of dollars in savings for customers. Ellsberg says this does not excuse ComEd's illegal conduct, but he says it's a distinct issue from the effect that that pair of laws at the heart of all of this had on customers. Comed does have more potential trouble ahead. However, tomorrow, the company is set to appear before state regulators. The Illinois Commerce Commission going to hold a hearing on Comed's ethical conduct. Now, the ICC, chaired by Carrie Zaleski, she is the sister-in-law of former Chicago alderman Mike Zaleski, who is named in the Fed's court filings. Also, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot says ComEd has to prove that it has shaped up if it wants to hold on to a lucrative franchise deal that it's got with the city that is up for renewal. Now, you can find more details on that, as well as copies of all of these court filings on our website. For now, though, back to you guys in the studio. Amanda, thank you. Now back to Paris Shuts and a conversation with a Secret Service agent turned police chief who took a bullet for a president. Paris. Brandis, March 30th, 1981, shots were fired at President Ronald Reagan. Chicago native Tim McCarthy was a 32-year-old Secret Service agent assigned to Reagan's detail. He was called on to make what could have been the ultimate sacrifice when he placed his body between the president and would-be assassin John Hinckley Jr. McCarthy got hit with the third of six shots that Hinckley fired that day. And for the past 26 years, Tim McCarthy has served as the chief of police in South Suburban Orland Park, Recently, he announced he is retiring from that post. And joining us now is Chief Tim McCarthy to talk about his 48 years in law enforcement. Tim McCarthy, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome, Paris. So um, we want to talk about that fateful day uh, in a bit. But first, let's talk about your career in Orland Park. You've been police chief since 1994. What are the biggest impacts that your tenure has had on the community? Well, I think we've been able, uh, with the assistance of our mayor and the board, and certainly our residents, to take this department uh, in, in a far different direction than when I got here. Uh, community policing was a concept at that time, and we were able to develop it over these 26 years and make it an integral part of everything we do here. And if, if um, history is any um, measure, during the first two weeks of June, when we had uh, civil unrest throughout the country and certainly in our metropolitan areas and some here in Orland Park, uh, the outpouring of support from our residents was unbelievable. Uh, uh, water, gift cards, food, and everything flooding into our, our station from our residents. So you didn't see the contention uh, between residents and police officers that you've seen in like the city of Chicago? Yeah, and I know they have great support in the city too. But over 26 years, we put in dozens and dozens of community policing programs that have, have brought the police and the citizens closer together here in Orland Park. Whether it's bike patrol, beat meetings, uh, police in the park, cookout with the cops, national night out, and all the different uh, of other events that we've put in place, all of our work in the schools, Narcan, you know, uh, Nar Narcan was not the most popular thing for police when it first came well, out. I want to I want to get to that. Narcan, you were one of the first police departments to equip officers with Narcan or naloxone to inject uh, if someone was overdosing on an opioid or heroin. It was controversial at the time because 
perhaps people saw it as tacitly encouraging drug use. Why did you want to do that? Well, the, the bottom line is everyone who overdoses is someone's son's son or daughter. And that's the reason to do it, to save a life. And while that same person may be a problem for us three months later, and actually days later when they recover, if they're committing minor or petty crime, they're still someone's son or daughter. And it's important to save lives too. And uh, our officers were trained and we've saved, do saved dozens of lives uh, over the four or five years that we've had Narcan. Our crisis intervention team you know, that we've put together of about 35 officers, um, where we, we're not experts, but we're able to uh, better identify symptoms of mental illness and get them the best outcomes, whether it's a voluntary commitment, involuntary, alternative to arrest, those are major programs. And we just received a three quarter of a million dollar grant from the federal government to enhance this program so that ultimately, once we stabilize a situation, we'll have professional mental health clinicians treat the person rather than the police. Take away that police interaction, get the experts there. And, th and this and is... This is something being talked about in, in so many police departments across the country. Just want to get your reaction to the protests that have happened since the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Folks really upset uh, with the militarization of the police and, and with how black and brown communities have been treated. What's your reaction to all this unrest? Well, my, my reaction is first that uh, what happened was wrong. We know it. There is no place for it. For it. Uh, the results from the standpoint of the officer being fired and charged were absolutely appropriate. And we ought to congratulate Minneapolis that they did it the right way in that sense. Now, what led up to it is something altogether different. But naturally, in my position, I can't condone any violence because every time there's violence, there's a victim, too. And there's been many victims of businesses burnt out and many times and small business people. So I can't condone violence, naturally. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the outcome was what should have should have happened. And maybe 25 years ago, that wouldn't have happened, but it did. So uh, that part was very good. What's happened since then is going to be controversial for many, many years to come. And is there room for improvement in policing? Without a doubt, there's room for improvement. No one ever said uh, that there wasn't. But on the other hand, there's room for improvement in a lot of professions. So... I think we need to take the good with the bad, try to weed out the bad uh, parts of it, and hopefully we will improve as a result. And you just kind of alluded to this. You know, we hear these cries of defund the police. I talk to police officers all the time that say we don't want to focus on mental health issues. Those should be mental health professionals. We want to do the bread and butter of policing. And you talked about how in Orland Park, um, there is a delineation there. So, so what about this notion of defunding the police and you know, moving police away from having to deal with domestic issues, mental health issues. If you can do it, great. And this grant that we're going to get, which is going to cost money, it's a three quarter million dollar grant, is a move in that direction. Because indirectly we have been defunded. Well, when we've taken on, like every police department has done, everyone now is trained in crisis intervention. There's a cost to that, not just for the training, but for the time of the training. But it's a good thing. But the ones that should really do it are the mental health professionals. And in this state, as you know, mental health has been defunded. Uh, on the southwest side, the Tinley Park Mental Health Center was closed a number of years ago. Now, there's no suburbs poorer than the ones in the south southwest suburbs of Chicago. How does that help that we lose a place like the Tinley Park Mental Health Center? So there has been some of that. We work domestics constantly uh, where we're sending young men and women, 25, 26 years old, into homes where there's domestics, normally fueled by alcohol, by drugs, where people are addicted, where nothing has worked so far, but we expect a young 25 or 26 year old to go in there and try to solve the problem. It's, it's, certainly, it's certainly a difficult task. Tim McCarthy, don't go anywhere. We're gonna be right back. And we will have more with Tim McCarthy in just a few minutes, including his firsthand account of the Reagan assassination attempt. But for now, we go back to you, Brandis. Paris, thank you. This next story is about finding artwork in an unlikely place. Arts correspondent Angel Ito takes us to Evanston, where an artist is transforming her neighborhood one garage door at a time. A trip to Bali, a galaxy in outer space, a home away from home. 
These are just some of the places Teresa Parad hopes to take you in her latest public art series that just so happens to be in her alley. It was after seeing an artist in Cuba transform a mundane space and with a little push from her son that she realized she could do the same. It just made me see where you could take a space that was just lackluster and make it into something really special. So then I came back and I painted my garage and then uh, I didn't know how the neighbors would react. And I was a little worried, but they liked it. And so then they all asked me to make paint their garages. I give them some drawings and I always try to give them a drawing of something that's totally completely different than what they want. So we go with that idea and um, I use house paint and I'm lucky that I work with a professional house painter. I take a picture of the garage, print it, draw on it, hand it to the people, see what they think, we go from there. Well, known as the driving tour, with limited options this summer due to COVID-19, why not get out and make it a walking tour instead? Neighbors say Parade's paintings have transformed their alley into a garden, among other things. Teresa had the brilliant idea to make a place that is not normally uh, generally beautiful um, into a place of beauty and tranquility. Now we have an alley that people want to spend time in, and I think it was a COVID entertainment for a while. <laughs> They'd say, well, we've we got to go down this alley. We would always walk around Evanston just to see the murals, and it's really cool that finally there's one in our garage. But it doesn't end on her block. Parade's paintbrush has dipped off into a couple of other alleys in Evanston. Do you think My Yard is Magical at Midnight kind of also transforms uh, this part of the alley, right? Oh. Because I think it kind of plays a little mm -hmm. hand in hand. Well, I hope, I hope it makes people feel good. Parade hopes she's able to transform as many garages as her neighbors will allow. And I also think it's a surprise is that you come down the alley and you're not expecting to see an alley full of paintings. And that it's fun because sometimes I'll see people who are just like walking their dogs or, you know, just riding their bike or whatever. They're like, wait, what is this? For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. If you're interested in leading your own art tour, the murals can be found in the alley of Thayer Street between McDaniel and Walnut Avenue in neighboring alleys in Evanston. Teresa Parada is booked through the season but has a wait list available for next year. We have more information on that wait list and her other artwork on our website. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, the debate over how media organizations should draw the line between news and opinion. Retiring Orland Park Police Chief and former Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy on his role in protecting President Reagan from assassination. Why the national coin shortage? Details on that, plus how you can help the problem. And exploring a historic art collection at a Chicago club filled with history. But first... A shot of good news yesterday as the final stage trial of one of the coronavirus vaccines being developed got started. The first doses were administered at several sites around the U.S. testing a vaccine developed by Moderna and the National Institutes of Health. Some volunteers will get the real thing, some a placebo. Dr. Anthony Fauci of the Coronavirus Task Force says these vaccines are coming faster than any before ever have. So to go from not even knowing what the virus was in early January to a phase three trial is really record time. And I might add, it was not done compromising safety, nor was it done compromising scientific integrity. Joining us now with more are Dr. Richard Novak, Chief of Infectious Diseases at UI Health and the lead investigator of UIC's vaccine trial with Moderna, and Dr. Babafemi Taiwo, Chief of Infectious Diseases at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine and lead investigator of Northwestern's vaccine trial with AstraZeneca. Welcome, doctors, both of you to Chicago tonight. Dr. Novak, let's start with you, please. So the next phase of the Moderna trial kicked off yesterday at some of the sites. When do we expect uh, Chicago's will be up and running? Uh, we'll be uh, starting about uh, mid-August. At this point, we're uh, still waiting for some of the materials to come in. And, and there's, there's a staggered start for the sites, and, uh, and uh, they've uh, elected to have a start mid-August. It sounds like this is a big logistical undertaking. Give us a sense of that. 
Uh, it's enormous. Uh, there's, it's unprecedented, frankly, and, and its size. First of all, each of these trials is enrolling 30,000 people, and uh, that enrollment is supposed to take place over two months for each trial. So that's, that's definitely warp speed by any measure, and, uh, uh, and it's pretty much unprecedented. So uh, we, uh, we're gearing up. That means we have to hire a tremendous number of staff, and, and uh, we need more space. We're expanding the space that we're going to operate in. We're going to be using mobile clinics, and, uh, and in addition, we'll have uh, clinical trailers set up so we have adequate space. And uh, it's a huge so, undertaking. Yeah, so it's a heavy lift. Uh, Dr. Taiwo, uh, Northwestern is seeking 5,000 volunteers for the trial that it's participating in with AstraZeneca. Are you trying to recruit a particular group of people to volunteer? Yes, yeah, so uh, to, to clarify, we are enrolling now for a registry and that registry is where we plan to get at least 5,000 individuals. For the trial itself, we will be enrolling only 500 in the AstraZeneca trial. And these will be persons who are 18 years or older who have uh, risk factors or risk for exposure to COVID uh, with particular focus on people who have uh, risks for doing uh, poorly if they uh, contract COVID and also making sure that the demographic representation is taken into consideration, meaning that uh, the participants reflect uh, the society uh, racially and ethnically. Why is it also uh, you know, necessary to recruit those particular groups? It's very important because if any results were uh, obtained that did not include uh, all aspects or all segments of the society, then it's difficult to generalize, generalize the results. We know, for example, that the initial phase one and phase two studies of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine that we will be participating in, enrolled uh, individuals that were between 18 and 55 years old, and they were predominantly white. And I think if that were only the results that we had, or we replicated the same thing, it would not reflect society. We want to make sure that the results can be uh, valid in all uh, groups, particularly those that have been most impacted by the epidemic to date. Now, Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, said yesterday that there's some concern that people might be resistant to a vaccine, as in resistant to getting it. Um, here's a little of what we heard. We've got to get out there with people who are trusted at the community level to get individuals to understand that this is extremely important for their own health and importantly for the health of the community and the health of the nation. Now, there's a new poll showing that 30% said that they would get the vaccine as soon as possible, 50% would wait, and 20% would not get one at all. Dr. Novak, are there myths about this vaccine that need to be dispelled? Absolutely. As there are with most vaccines, there, there are lots of myths. One a common myth is that uh, the vaccine could give you the disease. It's simply impossible uh, because the vaccine is made up of only one small component of the virus and getting that part of the virus could not cause an infection. Another popular myth is that we researchers are giving the disease to people to see if they get it or not. That's simply not true. Uh, we, uh, as Dr. Uh, Taiwo pointed out, we're enrolling people who are at risk uh, of getting COVID-19 by virtue of their, their lifestyle or their workplace uh, or uh, the people that they live with and uh, the community that they live in. And so we know that because of their increased risk, uh, they're more likely to uh, acquire the infection during the course of the study. And we're not giving them the infection, but we're enrolling people who might get it. Uh, you keep, keep in mind that this is a placebo controlled study as you mentioned earlier, and that means that half the people will get a placebo and half will get the vaccine. In the end, what we're looking for is that there are fewer infections in the vaccine arm than there are in the placebo arm. That would be an indication the vaccine works, but we're not giving people the, the infection. They're going to get it just by living in the world. Um, and Dr. Taiwo, Taiwo, before I let the both of you go, do we have any idea when we might have a safe and effective vaccine that is widely available? Yeah, this is a the million dollar question. I think that what you can rest assured of is that all resources to make that date uh, as close as possible have been deployed. Uh, but exactly when it will happen, uh, no one can tell. 
I think the most optimistic estimates will put it at some time, some, sometime around the end of the year. Uh, others will say sometime in 2021. But the reality is that we do not know. I think what we have to do now, as has been as said by my colleague, is to really encourage the pop everyone to participate as much as they can uh, to get into the nooks and, and crannies of our society, go to churches, go to uh, healthcare providers, just this is a heavy lift for all of us and, and get all of us uh, engaged quickly. It will shorten the time for enrollment. And That's think, a critical think, component. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. I think everybody is, is hopeful for soon whatever soon might look like. Uh, my thanks to Dr. Richard Novak and Dr. Babafemi Taiwo. Thanks to you both. Best of luck. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now we've got more on the trials that Northwestern and UIC are participating in, including information on how to volunteer on our website. Up next, Paris shuts and differentiating between news and opinion. Stay with us. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. The Chicago Tribune is making a move to separate its news reporting and opinion columns, and it's causing a strong reaction among readers. This week, the paper announced it would move all columnists to a dedicated section away from news articles. And that includes the popular and controversial Page 2 column by John Cass, which will now be moved to that new opinion section. The changes come as the lines between opinion and reporting in print, social media, and cable news have grown increasingly blurred. Can news consumers tell the difference anymore? Joining us with more are Colin McMahon, Editor-in-Chief of the Chicago Tribune and Chief Content Officer at Tribune Publishing, and Charles Whitaker, Dean of the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University. Welcome both of you to Chicago Tonight. Thank you, Colin, I'll start with you. Explain the changes you're making at the Chicago Tribune and why you felt they were necessary. Yeah, good afternoon. So we made several changes. So over the last... Uh, Let's say over the last couple of years, uh, on, on the online side, we've made several changes to call out what is opinion content. We've added taglines, you know, little uh, italic lines to to people to say, "Hey, this is an opinion column or commentary." We've grouped columns and grouped commentary pieces in one place on the homepage. Um, called out that it's opinion in the in the headlines, and we haven't done that as much in uh, print. And so this week we decided, uh, we actually decided several months ago, but we decided that we were gonna start that this week and form a specific page in the A section, in what we call the A section, the main section, the front section, uh, where we would replicate what we do online. That is Tribune Voices, that's going to house all of the columnists and commentary writers who are not currently housed in the op-ed pages, and they'll all go there. Right, you have some op-ed columnists in that section, some scattered throughout the front section. Charles Whitaker, can this kind of a move help uh, delineate news versus opinion for news consumers? Yeah, I th certainly think it will help. It's a good first step. You know, for generations, I don't think people have really distinguished between opinion and news. We who are in the business sort of recognize that distinction. But when you talk to civilians, they'll talk about an article that they read and you'll dig a little deeper and often find out that they're really referring to an opinion piece. So the more that we can create signposts that help make that distinction clear for the reader, I think the better off we'll be. And Colin, there's been some backlash, especially among fans of John Cass, who's occupied this kind of vaunted page two real estate, you know, made famous by Mike Royko and now we'll be moving toward that new section in the back. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, so, so everybody who, um, you know, who writes in, and, and I've gotten a lot of letters over, um, you know, the last many years, but uh, particularly since I returned to the newsroom a few years ago, or a few months ago as editor-in-chief, you know, the people who, uh, who like Darlene Glanton or like John Cass, um, you know, they don't know that the people who don't like Darlene Glanton or don't like John Cass are also writing, right? And so I think that I've gotten a lot of emails about uh, in support of Cass, uh, in support of Glanton, and I've gotten many that say, uh, I'm glad you're doing this to this writer, uh, but don't do it to this writer. 
And my point is you can't do it to just some writers and not other writers. That's the whole point of this. You have to do it with everybody so it's very clear what is news coverage and what is opinion. Charles, let's extrapolate this out. I mean, this is an issue that's been raging in social media, cable news for years, uh, print media. Um, how big a problem is news literacy and news consumers not knowing the difference between news, opinion, fake news, misinformation? I think it's an incredible problem. I don't, I don't think, as I said, we've been particularly transparent. It's a problem of our own me making because I don't think we've been particularly transparent in helping people make that distinction. Um, they look at the paper. They don't pay attention to the geography. We've had these sort of geographic uh, signs that sort of help people understand this is the these are the op-ed pages and these are the news pages. But again, regular consumers don't pay attention to that as closely as we think they would and should. So this is an effort to sort of educate them about what the geography of the paper means, and we've got to do that loudly and clearly. It, you know, Colin, uh, more and more people click on news that they find on a Twitter post or a Facebook post. How do you? Uh, delineate between news and opinions on those avenues? Yeah, so the kind of research that, that Dean Whitaker is talking about is really valuable to us. Uh, of course, the personal um, the personal response we get from readers about this, that really drives a lot of it. But there is research that shows that uh, fewer than half of all people uh, who consume uh, news on social media or online uh, can routinely figure out what's news and what's opinion. So if you're coming from a social uh, media site, you need to have very clear when that person clicks in what it is, right? That this is an opinion piece, that this is uh, this is not news coverage. And, you know, you have this kind of ladder, right? The first ladder is get them to click on the story, right? And not just decide what they think or share it from the, the headline or the tweet alone. And then once you get them in, really be very clear about what it is that they are reading, what you are presenting. You know, Charles, I want to talk about uh, some controversies. You know, John Cass uh, got some backlash among some of his colleagues uh, for some of the columns that he's written. You saw at the New York Times, Barry Weiss had some backlash, and she said that caused her to quit. Is there a problem here with news organizations limiting voices because of controversy? I don't think this is a question of limiting voices. I think most um, news outlets actually try to do a pretty good job of balancing the voices in their opinion pages. I think it's a little disingenuous for either a Barry Weiss or a John Cass, for that matter. I don't think John has been as guilty of this as Barry to complain about being silenced because they often write with the intent to kind of poke a finger in people's eyes to sort of generate um, conversation. And that conversation isn't always going to be favorable. So you can't recoil when people sort of push back on your opinion. This is a marketplace of ideas. You've got to be ready to stand and stand up to those opinions that you put out. Co Colin, very quickly, do you have any reaction to some of the comments made by Tribune reporters about John Cass? I don't think that, I think that we are in a very difficult business and um, our jobs are hard enough uh, that to to manage with the economic headwinds, with the political climate, that I, I think that we need to all be pushing and pulling in the same direction. And uh, and so that's what I focus on. I focus on what I can control and what I can do to, to, to inform and empower readers. And I, and I think that that's what we should all be doing. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Our thanks to Colin McMahon and Charles Whitaker. Thank you. Thanks. And we're back to continue our conversation with Tim McCarthy about his role protecting President Ronald Reagan. But first, we take a look at the weather. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Early in the program, our guest Tim McCarthy shared his thoughts on his 26 years as police chief of suburban Orland Park, including calls to defund the police and how to build police community relations. He joins us again now to share more about his time as a Secret Service agent and being assigned to President Ronald Reagan's detail during that 1981 assassination attempt. Tim McCarthy, welcome back. 
Thanks, Paris. All right, March 30th, 1981. What do you remember about those moments? Well, I don't think about it a lot. Uh, but in the end, uh, Paris, when uh, John Hinckley attacked the president, he fired six rounds in 1.4 seconds. And we trained for that like police train to go down a dark alley, like the military trains to charge up a hill. So you constantly train for it in, in live scenarios. You never think it's going to happen to you, however. Uh, on that particular day, it did. And my job at that time, walking in the formation around the president, was to cover the president while others evacuated him to a safe area. But I have to admit there was, there was, <laughs> it was, my actions on that day were based upon an awful lot of training. I'd like to say it was a pretty brave act, but it was really the result of training. You don't do things in the military like they do, firemen going into burning buildings and policemen down dark alleys. Uh, it's based an awful lot on training. So at the end of the day, uh, what I'm most proud of is when that critical incident occurred, that I was able to do what I was trained to do on that day. And we never know when the next critical incident takes place, if we'll be able to do it right, if that training will overwhelm us and we do the right thing or or maybe not. And one never knows. So well, clearly the result of a very, very good training uh, trained me to cover the president. And on that occasion, I was able to do it. I, th I think you're being very humble there. You know, fellow Secret Service agent Jerry Parr was with you that day. He said... If you were not there, either he or President Reagan would have been directly hit. Do you think about the implications of what happened or what could have happened? Well, it, uh, that's a great question, Paris, and it is the most important question. Because if President Reagan was killed, the course of history would have been changed, undoubtedly. The only way the president is supposed to leave after elected is either by getting by not getting elected for a second term or getting impeached. And that's what the Secret Service is there for. We don't protect the Republican. We don't protect the Democrat. We protect the office of, of the president for a moment of madness by a lone gunman in that case. So that whatever, whether people liked President Reagan's policies or they didn't, the people elected him to do it. And uh, I served with both with President Carter for a couple of years and President Bush as well. And that's what the Secret Service is there for, to allow the president to do his job. He was elected and only should be removed at the ballot box or by impeachment. I, I understand that um, after that, you met with President Reagan in the hospital. What was that meeting like? Well, I met with the president an awful lot after that because I was back on his detail for another over four years. Uh, well, it was my last day in the hospital and he was going to be there for a few more. I had two of my children with me at the time. And we went up to the president's room with my wife, of course, and uh, the president was still hooked up to a number of machines that I'd been hooked up to. And by the way, they attracted the attention of my kids, the red and blue lights and so forth. So my wife was getting really nervous uh, mm -hmm. while we were there. We have a wonderful conversation. Uh, but by the time we were walking out the door, the president uh, stopped me at the door and said, uh, Tim, hold on a minute. Listen, it was uh, McCarthy, Brady, Delahanty, Reagan. What the hell did this guy have against the Irish? So uh, the president uh, was a great model. When you go through a critical incident, uh, there is a theory that some people, a third of the people never recover, another third recover enough to go back to work, and another third have no reaction to it at all after they're healed. And the president was a great example for that top tier that uh, was ready to bounce back. And so, Of course, you, you took the bullet and you were in the hospital yourself. Were you worried uh, about your life? And has that impacted you since? How close you came to death? Well, it did. It, it, Nat, I don't want to be too uh, glib about it, but it, it crossed my mind uh, while I was in the hospital. Uh, and I was sitting there, you know, with the president was in one waiting area, I'm in another, and Jim Brady in another, and it certainly did cross my mind. Uh, what it convinced me most at the end, uh, as my wife said, why didn't you have that bulletproof vest on? Mm. So that was, uh, it was on a whole lot more after that. But uh, certainly that crossed my mind, but I had great doctors and great surgeons and great therapists, and I was back to work in about three months. So, uh, you know, it was one of those things, it, it comes with the territory, though you never think it's gonna happen to you, and you live in a profession that sometimes has to cope with some violence yourself. Many professions do. So really it's something that probably we ought to think about a little bit more than we do. Uh, but I'm happy I'm sitting here doing an interview with you uh, many, many years later. 
Well, Tim McCarthy, congratulations on your retirement and on your career, and we thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Paris. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Thank you, Paris. In recent weeks, you may have come across a notice, like this one, explaining that the U.S. is experiencing a nationwide coin shortage and to pay either the exact amount of change or to use another form of payment. So what exactly is behind the lack of loose change out there? Joining us with more backstory is WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley. So Patty, why is there a shortage of change? Well, to be clear, the U.S. Mint says there's not a shortage of change out there. It's just that everybody's kind of hoarding it, so it's not circulating. People aren't um, making cash transactions. And the fact is that about 80% of the coins that circulate in our economy come from retail activity or people dropping them off at those like coin kiosks, like Coinstar, and people just haven't been doing that so the coins aren't circulating out there. So how can the average consumer or customer help with this problem? So the Mint would like you to take your change jars, like the one that I have there, and cash it in, um, either if your bank still accepts them or one of those coin processing kiosks. Or if you can find businesses that do accept cash, and that's another if, because with the coronavirus, a lot of people don't feel comfortable exchanging cash. But if you can find some place that will take your cash, try and pay with exact coins. So if you've got coins sitting in a jar, try and spend them. And also check your couch for that <laughs> loose <your> change. <laughs> your car, yeah. the cup holder. Your laundry. <laughs> exactly. All right, Patty Wetley, thanks as always. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website. That's at WTTW.com slash news. 141 years ago, a local club formed to support good government and a third term for President Ulysses S. Grant. Grant did not get that nomination, but the Union League Club of Chicago still welcomes presidents and dignitaries and explores public policy. It's also home to a massive art collection that includes a Monet and a passel of Pashkis. Arts producer Mark Vitale recently gave us a virtual tour of a private club with a public focus and an eye for artwork. Here's another look. The walls are filled with early American artwork, Depression-era oil paintings like Our Daily Bread, dramatic vistas of Yosemite Valley, and this view of Garfield Park painted more than a century ago. There's also contemporary work, including new acquisition, Back of the Bus for Now, by local artist David Anthony Geary, a 1990s holographic work by Ed Paschke, and this playful, windy cityscape by Roger Brown. The club was founded in 1879. The collection itself, the members from the first day of its inception, decided that culture was key, key for the future. Many of the members were distinguished individuals in Chicago that really set the foundation for the beauty of our city. Members included Daniel Burnham and Louis Sullivan. But like many clubs of the era, it was slow to welcome Jews, blacks, and women into the ranks. We have a saying that women were on the walls before they were in the halls. And that means, as we know, many clubs and universities were divided by sex. Before women were officially members here, we had art by female artists from the early 1900s. There is art everywhere, and absolutely the best collection of art of any private club, I would say, in the world, in breadth and in quality. Their most famous work is Monet's Apple Trees in Blossom, worth millions. It's currently on loan to an art exhibition in Germany. We purchased it back in 1895. At that time, Claude Monet was still alive. So when we purchased this work of art, it was a contemporary work of art. There are more than 700 works in a collection that continues to grow, even as the club suspended operations during the pandemic. The Union League Club is doing well, considering the circumstances. We have been around for over 140 years. We've lived through so many other turbulent times, and we continue not only to collect, but we also exhibit emerging artists. And so we have this great history right on our walls, and also an exemplar of great beauty and what one can achieve. Culture, 
helps us to become better people. It inspires us to do better things. And that's really, I think, what the Union League Club is all about. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. Since this piece first aired, the Union League Club has since fully reopened with accordance to guidelines set by the city and state. Public tours are also up and running, but those interested should make a reservation with the club in advance. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown reflects on his first 100 days on the job. And meet the all-black rowing team that made history at a Westside High School. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.